the Asante Warrior Queen. March 25, 1900. A British Governor General of the Gold Coast, Frederick Hodgson entered the city, greeted with traditional honors and a resounding chorus of, God Save the Queen, sung by children. Standing upon a platform, Hodgson addressed the assembled Asante leaders, his words laden with veiled authority and an unsettling demand. The crowd held their breath, their hearts pounding with anticipation, as he unleashed his proclamation upon them. King Prempe I, the beloved ruler, was declared exiled, his power and authority to be seized by the representative of the Queen of Britain. The room quivered with the weight of his words, their hopes dashed in an instant. But it was not solely the exiled king that Hodgson sought to subdue. Like a predator eyeing its prey, he reminded them of the forgotten terms of the 1874 Peace Treaty of Fomina, requiring a heavy price for the 1874 war, now compounded with interest amounting to £160,000 per year. This amount threatened to drain their coffers and cripple their future. And then, with a calculated twist of the knife, Hodgson turned his attention to the revered symbol of the Asante nation, the Golden Stool. His voice dripped with disdain, his disappointment palpable, as he questioned their failure to present the sacred artifact for him to seat on. The gathered Asante leaders felt a collective knot tighten in their chests, their dismay etched upon their faces. Hodgson's words struck at the core of their identity, challenging their beliefs and shaking the foundation of their sovereignty. To the Asante, the golden stool, was a symbol of divine power and ancestral wisdom. According to the ancient tales whispered, it was the high priest and one of the illustrious founders of the Asante Confederacy, who wove the threads of magic and destiny to bring the golden stool into existence. Legend spoke of a day when the heavens themselves opened, and the magnificent throne descended from the celestial heights, gently finding its place on the lap of the first Asante king, Osei Tutu. The ethereal glow emanating from its golden surface mirrored the hopes and dreams of a united people. The golden stool was believed to house the spirit of the Asante nation in its entirety. It held within its golden embrace the souls of the living, the spirits of the departed, and the aspirations of those yet to be born. It was against this backdrop of the threat to the golden stool, that a remarkable woman emerged, Ya Santiwa, the warrior queen mother. Ya Santiwa, born in 1840 in the village of Basis, emerged from humble beginnings. As she grew, Ya Santiwa became acquainted with the rich traditions and legends of the Asante. The tales of the golden stool, the bravery of Asante warriors, and the indomitable spirit of her ancestors ignited a fire within her. During the reign of her brother, Ya Santiwa witnessed the Asante Confederacy endure a series of tumultuous events, including a devastating civil war that lasted from 1883 to 1888. The Asante kingdom was grappling with internal conflicts that threatened its stability and future. When her brother passed away in 1894, Ya Santiwa seized her rightful position as queen mother and exercised her authority by nominating her own grandson as chief. However, the British authorities exiled her grandson to the Seychelles in 1896, along with King Prempt I of the Asante Kingdom and other members of the Asante government. In the face of this unjust exile, Ya Santiwa assumed the role of regent for the Ajisajoban district, steadfastly protecting the interests of her people. The climax of the Asante people's struggles came on that fateful day, March 25, 1900, when Hodgson demanded the surrender of the Golden Stool. It was within this somber atmosphere that Ya Santiwa, with an air of regality addressed the assembly with a resolute tone that stirred the very souls of those present. How can a proud and brave people like the Asante sit back and look while the white men take away our king and chiefs, and humiliate us with a demand for the golden stool? Her voice echoed with unwavering resolve, each word striking like a thunderclap in the stillness. The golden stool only means money to them, they have scoured every inch of our land in search of it. But I declare this, I shall not pay one predwan to the governor. She continued, her voice rising, I must say this, if you, the men of Asante, will not go forward, then we will. We, the women, will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight. We will fight till the last of us falls in the battlefields. To further underscore her unwavering resolve, Ya Santiwa seized a nearby gun, its cold metal glinting in the candlelight. With a decisive gesture, she fired a single shot, the deafening echo symbolizing the thunderous roar of defiance that erupted within her heart. In that moment, the room was charged with an electrifying energy. Ya Santiwa had kindled a flame within the hearts of the Asante people that could not be extinguished. Her impassioned speech and dramatic act of defiance, set in motion a chain of events that would forever alter the course of their history. The stage was now set for the epic battle that would come to be known as the Asante-British War of the Golden Stool.
The air was thick with tension as the enraged Asante populace rallied behind their warrior queen mother, Yasantiwa. In the midst of the chaos, Captain Cecil Armitage, the deputy of Governor General Hodgson, led a desperate search for the golden stool. His forces scoured the nearby brush, their eyes scanning for any sign of the sacred symbol. But their search was cut short as the deafening sounds of war engulfed them. The Asante warriors, fierce and relentless, ambushed the British troops from all sides, their battle cries piercing the air. Yet, just as victory seemed within reach for the Asante, a sudden torrential rainstorm unleashed its fury upon the battlefield. The downpour became a temporary shield for the retreating British forces, allowing them to seek refuge in the fortified British offices in Kumasi. Behind the high stone walls and firing turrets, the defenders braced themselves for the impending storm. The Asante erected impenetrable log barricades, cutting off all escape routes. After weeks of dwindling supplies and disease, a daring breakout was executed by Captain Hodgson and a few survivors. The Asante pursued, but the escapees managed to slip away, finding salvation on a ship bound for Accra. The war had taken its toll on both sides. However, those who survived carried with them a tale of resilience, determination, and the unwavering spirit of Yasantiwa, the warrior queen mother who had led them. In the year 1921, far removed from the vibrant rhythms of the Asante kingdom, Yasantiwa took her final breath in exile in the Seychelles, a place foreign and unfamiliar. Yasantiwa was survived by her daughter, Nana Ama Sirwa, and her grandson, Kofo Teng. Years later, the remains of Yasantiwa, the warrior queen, were tenderly brought back to the soil of her beloved Ghana, where her spirit had always yearned to rest. Yasantiwa's legacy lives on, not only in the annals of Asante history, but also in the hearts of Ghanaians and people around the world, who recognize her remarkable contributions. Her story continues to inspire individuals to stand up against injustice, fight for what they believe in, and protect the values that define their cultures and communities. Thank you for watching our story, The Asante Warrior Queen, and we hope you enjoyed it. What lessons did you draw from this story? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and be part of the tribe. Thank you for watching, The Tales of the Savannah. We will see you next time, in the Savannah.